You're about to view an episode of Sites on Ed Tech, Zanichelli Ventures interview series with people from the education technologies world. I'm your host, Luigi Morino, and in this episode, I interviewed Garrett Smiley, co-founder and CEO of Sora Schools, a live virtual project-based middle and high school with a non-traditional curriculum designed around students' interests and learning styles. Here is the interview. So I'm very happy to be speaking to Garrett today. Thank you for joining us, Garrett. Thanks for having me. Sure, sure. So first of all, could you please explain what Sora Schools is? Sure. Sora is the very simple version. <laughs> Sora is an accredited online, innovative, throw another adjective in there, middle and high school. So uh, we believe that a transformative education is possible, right? A better education is possible. In fact, they exist all around the world, but the vast majority of students don't have access to it. The vast, vast majority, 99.9% .9 of students really outside of the top 0.1% of rich people, uh, they don't, many students don't have access to this type of education. So the question we ask ourselves is, can you bring this world-class innovative education that, that does exist in some of these institutions and bring it to everyone else, right? It's at a cost point that's competitive with um, with a public education. So that, that's where Sora started and we're a very nuanced, complicated proposition, which I'm sure we will uh, we will uncover in this conversation, but that that's the quick and dirty version. <laughs> yeah, of course, the follow-up question is what is the recipe to unlock that? To unlock that, that wide-scale transformative education? The accessibility of it, yes, for sure. Mm. So online is a huge portion of it. One thing that we noticed when we started SOAR, we started SOAR actually before the pandemic. We were the crazy people talking about a remote school in 2019. It's going to change the world. And everyone's like, you're crazy. Shut up, right? <laughs> was the yeah. response in 2019. Uh, but we had a loyal community of people who joined us and wanted to be collaborators in this process. But really the thesis was, as I said, this transformative education is possible. In fact, it happens every day to hundreds of thousands, if not um, millions of people. Uh, and then you notice the trend in 2019, even before the pandemic, many of the best workplaces, Google, Microsoft, you know, yeah. critical infrastructure for modern society, they were moving much of their offices online. Yeah. So if those people who are keeping the world working in many respects and <laughs> decided that their employees could have a high fidelity uh, collaborative workplace online, why are we spending such a significant portion of the budget of education on in-person spaces, right? Can we bring the 90% of what makes a transformative education exactly that, transformative, uh, and move it online, which unlocks many more superpowers, I might add. It's not only do you skip the real estate costs, and you also make it so any a faculty from across the world can educate your student, which people are 90% of the power of education, to be very clear, uh, but they're not 90% of the cost, right? So that's the the arbitrage opportunity, but then you look at the superpowers of an online program. The obvious ones are, like I just said, the faculty can be anywhere, but also the students can be anywhere. The best way for, especially in middle and high school, for a student to get this worldly education, to, to understand the world and develop a worldview, what's important, which I think is uh, the point of education, under, like starting to create a hypothesis for what it means to live a good life. The best way to do that is to interact with people who are very different than you, right? <laughs> and, and have those those debates and those formative conversations. So being an online school means you don't just have to attend uh, a program with the students in a five or 10 mile radius around you. And for many families who, who opt into a private education, they're really getting an even smaller sample, right? The yeah. rich kids within your neighborhood, essentially. It doesn't make a very diverse education. Your kid will not understand how the world works, not even to mention how arbitrary most subjects are. We'll get to that in a second, but um, that's the one layer, the the access and the, the global community this sort of education creates. But the second one, being someone with a computer science background, this gets me super excited, the data that comes off, if you will, of a remote education is so powerful. So now our, our faculty members, the professional development opportunities are limitless. Our, our faculty get reports that say, here's the talk breakdown by you versus the students. Here are the, the questions that got the biggest response. This student isn't engaging much. You should schedule time to talk about them with them, what's going on, or even more direct insights, such as uh, this student speaks 30% less in this subject than the other subjects. 
your advisor needs to dive in and see what's going on, right? So that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We do so much at SOAR. We've developed all of our own software and LMS. We don't use any of that Google Classroom or anything like that. Um, so yeah, that, that's just an online education isn't just the access or isn't just the flexibility, which it is. It's all this other stuff too, right? School When school goes in the cloud, it gives us superpowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, let's take a step back. It's fully online then. For the most part. So that's where we're starting. We're trying to build this educational engine that can fit anywhere, right? We're trying to build like a, a Honda, a Honda engine that can go on an airplane or, right? So go with you wherever you want. And then you can augment in-person experiences if that works for your family, or we call them signature experiences, which are kicking off this year, like trips across the world and in-person field trips. Um, but I think the core education experience should be online. So yes, you can go anywhere with you, but also you can have access to that community we mentioned before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were talking about uh, uh, the transform this transformative education, as you call it. What are the pillars of uh, a 21st century education as you envision it? Great question. I think there can be many answers to this question. I'll give you the Sora answer. And I already touched on it a bit. But the power of an education is for a student to understand the world, right? I think it's somewhat of an obvious point, but in the design of our traditional schools, you completely lost sight of this. So most students march through school learning extremely arbitrary subjects like chemistry or uh, European history or, you know, these classic school subjects, which are completely abstracted away from what makes them meaningful or, or what even makes them useful right? So students are marching through this curriculum where they learn these facts and fragments that don't really connect to anything of meaning or value, which not only is boring, right? Uh, the brain is a relevance finding machine. So we have to resort to, to threats and extremely rigid curriculum. And we, we're all familiar with the failings of traditional education today. Um, but I think school should be interdisciplinary, which most educators, by the way, if you talk to them, they will agree that's the better scenario. It's just really hard to pull off. We have software that does it, but I'm sidetracking. Uh, the most important thing is for a student to have choice, to say, this is what I find valuable and meaningful. So here are where my interests lie. Here's what I want to discover about the world. Choosing which experiences and how they want to uh, learn things. So having that agency, being an active participant, grabbing the steering wheel, we say, of your education, that's an extremely important aspect because traditional school pacifies students. Right? It makes, take, makes them take the back seat and they know as, as long as they show up to when you tell me to and, and follow the steps, everything will be all right. But that's not how life works, right? So agency and choice, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary education. Um, uh, I'll say, yeah, I guess we can stop there. <laughs> Wait, uh, I can go on forever if you yeah, would like. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. But uh, it, it, talking about uh, the, the various underlying skills that subjects should uh, um, should teach Ooh. kids and uh, they, uh, they actually end up often in traditional schooling, they end up not. And even in the, the, the program itself and the curriculum itself, there is, it's often unclear, depending on country by country, sure, but uh, what the actual... Uh, underlying objective is right so uh, let's take some of the important skills like metacognitive abilities or uh, uh, abstract thinking or uh, any uh, learning science uh, important cognitive ability right um, how do you envision uh, subjects being able to uh, and to to transmit this to students and also as a second question how do you envision uh the possibility of measuring this in some way to be able to say okay students are actually improving in this uh aspect through the sora engine through the sora uh platform that's such a good question and i'll take a step back to set the context for my previous answer <laughs> which is i think a failing of much of progressive education is writing off the need for a common set of standards or outcomes for students. I think it's, I'll, I may catch flack for this, but I think it's honestly silly when I hear educators say, uh, students need to learn what they want. So if they don't learn to read or whatever, or, you know, it's like students will learn to read if it's important to them. That's yeah. absurd from my perspective. You, The students, there are so many important historical 
scientific, whatever facts that a student needs to know to be equipped to contribute yeah. to the world and also to develop their worldview, which I've talked about multiple times now. Yeah. But we can't just skip them. We need to ensure the students get a certain breadth and depth uh, in their middle and high school experience. However, to get to your question, yeah. I don't think it needs to be a rigid progression in almost all cases. There are what we call prerequisites at Sora. So you can't learn our quantum mechanics unit. So I'll, de I'll define my terms in a second. You can't learn the quantum mechanics units unless you've learned algebra, right? <laughs> like there are some explicit uh, dependencies like that. But for the vast majority of things, I'll say 80 to 90%, I don't care if you learn about ancient Athens before you learn about the US constitution. So we're a US-based school right now. Oh. So that's that's why that example, it's in, even though that traditionally isn't the sequence, if we can align the learning to your interests, that is a big win. That is a very big win. And I'm willing to have a flexible curriculum that can adapt around a student's whims if it means they can find a relevant interest, right? Yeah. Or buy-in. We talk about buy-in and motivation a lot at Sora. Um, so we have a flexible curriculum. And the best way to conceptualize it although it's much more complicated than this, I'll say. We have a full software suite that makes sure every student is get, going to this path. You can imagine it that we have one bucket that we call units yeah. and another bucket we call abilities. So abilities are the things you just spoke about, which I think are arguably more important than just the content knowledge, right? So metacognition, teamwork, uh, uh, argumentation, right? These sort of things that you do, you don't just know. So that's one side. And then we have units, which are 100 years of war, you know, whatever, right? All the classic stuff you would associate with school. And we make sure that the student through their six-year journey at Sora, so students can be here up to six years, they are checking off, if you will, all of these boxes and proving their competency. Um, but like I said, not a rigid path. So by the end of the six years, interdisciplinary, they're signing up for classes like the physics of, sharks or you know the the uh, how to solve a murder or you know all these interdisciplinary expeditions that they think are exciting um and they are checking off or thesis they can submit a thesis proposal or they can there's so many ways to learn at sora yeah. infinite actually and they're checking off all of these requirements and we have software that helps them visualize what we call pace so just making sure they're learning enough new stuff quickly enough to yeah. hit their goals and graduate on time. But outside of that, you know, we really want to give the student agency. And, and this is something that your IT, has, uh, IT team has developed, the PACE uh, software. Exactly. So we have a software that we call Sora Home, which yeah. is only internal. People have been asking us for multiple years now, even before this version 2 came out this year, which is amazing. People have been asking to use the software. But all I can say is that it empowers our educators to to provide our pedagogy. So yeah. it's a it's a marriage, right? I can't just give you the software unless you're willing to commit to full transformation of your approach to school and learning. <laughs> so uh, right now it's just internal, but I'll say our, our product team led by an incredible chief product officer who grew one of the most well-respected engineering design agencies to a thousand plus you know, people. And he's bringing a level of sophistication and quality to our product development that is just not seen in education like period, you know, so combining this world-class faculty with world-class software is creating an incredible learning experience for our students. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and so uh, you spoke about all the, uh, uh, the soft skills and the, the, the uh, learning science skills that are powered through Sora, but how about the, um, how about the hard skills? Uh, let's take maths, uh, algebra skills, uh, statistics skills. Um, how do you teach those to students? Do you have some uh, level of fixed modules or are they also self-paced and also on, on some level of self-exploration uh, assisted by teachers and tutors? How does that happen? So most of our learning happens through synchronous learning. We call them expeditions. So our students every six weeks are given a buffet of options, yeah. right? And we call this the registration period. And they see in our software, uh, you have to fill up 100% of your pace. So you have to learn enough new stuff every six weeks to graduate on time, as I said. Um, but they're registering for 
the expeditions or they're submitting independent project proposals or they're doing you know tons of different things as long as it's tagged with enough of those units and abilities that i mentioned that they haven't learned yet divided by how much time they have left right there's an algorithm so for them they just feel like they're making choices informed choices that oh math and minecraft that seems cool and it fills up 40 percent of my bucket oh, this one seems really cool, but it only fills up 10%, but you know, I'm going to do it anyway. It might have some redundant skills that I've already learned, or units, we used to call them skills, uh, units that I've already learned, but you know, this seems really fun. This is a fun learning context. I want to take it. So they're filling up, they're making choices. Um, and through that process in the back end, our software is making sure we call this their skills map it's making sure that they are hitting all the core requirements you would expect through math through social studies through everything right they're going they're going to have exposure to a hundred years war they're going to know about the u.s constitution to use my same examples but the way they're doing it is much more fun and for them they have buy-in because they chose this right it's not when am i ever have to learn this because they're choosing to study it in a context that's exciting and relevant to them and all the content that they learn is content that you have prepared for them, or is your software actually even able to track their learning on, you know, other web pages outside of Sora uh, and the learning that happens there? Both. So our students enjoy our expeditions the most because interdisciplinary learning is, I will die on this hill, better. <laughs> it's more fun than just yeah. marching through a Khan Academy course called AP Bio, right? Not super fun, but learning about the physics of sharks is fun. Uh, so most of our students choose those, but for those who do just have a goal, we always try to contextualize the learning into a goal. So if you do want to you know, go to this really elite college or you, you, you have fallen in love with the subject of biology and you just do want to take AP bio, sure, they can submit, uh, a proposal essentially to say, by this day, I want to learn this amount of units through this context. And they work with an advisor to help them uh, fill that. So we have approved content providers basically. And this is before the call, uh, Luigi and I were talking about the modularity of the program. So this is where we can fit in the out school, the Khan Academy, the you know dozens of other providers, the, the Duolingo that we think are awesome. Uh, as an option for our students, because everything, it, options, options is what matters at Sora. <laughs> and uh, this sounds absolutely amazing, as we were saying, uh, the fact that Sora Schools is able to uh, bring together all these uh, ed tech providers uh, and, you know, offer solutions that, why, why do they always need to be developed ex novo, you know, from zero? Uh, and if, if someone out there is already providing this specific thing very, very well, um, you see, the, the educational ecosystem sometimes is is still not not that well connected. At the end of the day, it's it's uh, everyone's developing their own their own bits and pieces. But uh, I'm I'm really excited about this uh, way that you're opening to to various providers. By the way, so what are the providers that you're already utilizing? You mentioned Khan Academy. Yes, we have a few, and actually, as the students find things, we will vet them. So theoretically, it's infinite, right? As long as it's really high quality and it, it abides by our standards, we're willing to accommodate really anything. Our most popular ones are uh, what we call out, or not what we call, what's called outlier. So it's the co-founder of Masterclass created uh, college subjects, the University of Pittsburgh, and it gives you full credit. We also have very, very recently announced or are going to announce by the time this episode airs a partnership with. ASU, uh, ASU prep digital. So, but it's the ASU uh, college campus to give students full dual enrollment opportunities through Sora as well. So some of our students just really want to expand and take college level courses in this, this area of interest. And we go, awesome, you do that and we'll fully support you with an advisor and add it to your high school transcript. That's, and, and you get a college transcript, obviously. So that's a big win. Uh, we Things like Duolingo. I still don't know why Spanish textbooks exist, right? Like we have Duolingo. And yeah, anyway, that's a whole rant. That's actually a rant related to ed tech, right? So much of our time in education is spent competing with tools that are already better, right? It's like teachers will get up there and stand 
in front of a class and deliver what's essentially a worse YouTube video, <laughs> right? Like lecture-based learning. Yeah. Let's just use YouTube video, flip classroom style and support the students instead, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, totally. Uh, and um, yeah, this sounds extremely exciting. Uh, do formal requirements hinder you a little bit? <laughs> Actually less than you would think. So the US is, one of the most flexible countries when it comes to different styles of education and homeschooling and all that. We are a fully accredited program by Cognia, WASC, and NC improved by NCAA. So we have jumped those hurdles. We get the same transcript, uh, you know, stamp of approval as the fancy boarding schools, right? We have the exact same transcript, uh, at least the, the bodies behind it. I, I would argue ours is even better, but that's another topic. <laughs> um, so parents can rest in the fact that they can do this extremely innovative education and their kids will be happier. I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, but they can still get access to extremely prestigious elite selective colleges. In fact, our students already have, they've already been accepted to elite institutions like Georgia tech and, uh, but also have gotten jobs right out of high school. Like we had a student get a job directly for EA right out of high school. Right. So, uh, altruism. no, no, no. Uh, electronic arts. Ah, yeah. Okay. The, like the FIFA maker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. FIFA maker, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, parents don't really, they don't close doors for their students. We are fully accredited um, and we do have some federal requirements, but that's mostly around legal compliance. It's not really about content. There's, it's a complicated process. Luckily, we have a great legal team, but yeah. you would be surprised <laughs> by how little requirements there actually are around content. Yeah, um, I forgot to ask you about measurements. So uh, do you have uh, like ongoing um, uh, learning tracking? Do you do everything through learning analytics uh, or do you have uh, tests here and there of some, some kind, um, uh, formative assessments uh, or uh, summative assessments and whatnot? Yes, yeah, so this is an argument I have with every politician I, I ever meet. They want you to take standardized testing and separate it by year and say all fifth graders should know this by the end of fifth grade, right? All 11th graders should know this by the end of 11th grade. And it's kind of absurd. Like it's this little game that we've made hoops to jump through that don't really matter. I'm glad I, I will say this, which is heterodox to much of progressive education. I'm glad assessment happens. In yeah. fact, same way, I'm glad performance reviews happen in corporate America, right? Or corporate world. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm glad it happens because it's time for an honest conversation about your strengths and your weaknesses and what we're going to do to get better, right? Yeah. What really bothers me is that rigidity. So saying every student needs to know this set of subjects and perform to this level. Our assessment internally, so now I'll actually answer your question. <laughs> our assessment internally is vastly better. So our students are demonstrating each unit multiple times over the years at varying levels of depth. So this is like Bloom's taxonomy, right? It's better. We have internal norming for our assessment and we can see it's lines, not dots, right? As they say, we can see if a student is increasing their understanding with time, if it's holding steady, or if they've even lost some of their, their memory and we have spatial repetition tools, which we can talk about later. Um, but politicians will come in and say, no, you need to take one test once a year that shows it. I go, I have a thousand times more data points than you. You know, it doesn't make sense. So some countries are just going to be obstinate and whatever. And unless your students can attend remote school or after we, you know, take over the world and they get jealous, I'm sure they'll, they'll see the light. Yeah. Uh, but most people, especially in the U.S., with some of these laws that are written, they're starting to understand uh, that we need accountability and we need clarity into the operations of the school. But having extremely strict methods of assessment perhaps isn't the best idea so i'm i'm hopeful with the direction it's heading yeah 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 so um, to sum it all up uh you are uh putting your eggs uh fully in the continuous assessment uh, basket and hoping uh, if i understand it well to basically uh render um summative assessments quite uh uh unnecessary if i understand it well so we do so we have formative and summative uh i like i think both are really important it's just happening much more frequently than yeah. one yeah. big test a year right it's happening uh the quick math would be we're giving formative assessments to students every couple of weeks uh five or six every few weeks 
yeah. and we're giving them a summative assessment on their experiences. So here's from my assessment, how well you did uh, about every six weeks, a, a few every six weeks, but the very powerful thing. And I think it's actually a game changer. I, I, I should have mentioned it earlier. Everything at Sora, you can try again. We're yeah. trying to create this yeah. failure forward mindset in yeah. students. You don't fail something and you know, there go your shots at Yale, right? No, yeah, that's not yeah, how it yeah, works. Yeah. Do it again and show that you got better. <laughs> yeah, growth mindset imparting. This is exactly. so important. I think uh, so many uh, kids are actually made into victims of the traditional system because of a totally unnecessary, uh, hey, you had one shot, you missed it. Now, I mean, in Italy, sometimes that means you lose the year. I mean, you lost a year of your life because of the one or two shots that you might have missed. And, you know, um, but yeah, no, totally. And I laugh because educators, they have this line they like to say, which, which really frustrates me. They say, don't, you know, something like, don't take it too seriously. It's just one test. Like, you know, no, the kids are taking it seriously because it actually is extremely high stakes, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. don't mess up these three hours or that goal that you have is no longer possible. Is yeah. there, there are a few things in the world that are that high stress. So the kids are afraid of failure. We've made them afraid of failure very logically. They're responding to the incentive system we created. Uh, so at Sora, I and actually, this just reminded me, I was having a conversation uh, last week, actually a recorded conversation as well. And he said he dropped his daughter off at high school. And she said, he's like, what, what's your goals or something like that? She said, I just don't wanna fail. That was like her one sentiment going into school. That is yeah. such a toxic yeah. mindset because everything of value is created through iteration. Yeah. Nothing is right the first time. So if you create people who are afraid of failure, they're never going to create anything because the first version is going to be a failure every time. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so about uh, uh, providers you collaborate with, uh, we were mentioning Typepod Learning. Um, Seems like you have a quite solid partnership there. What's uh, what's it all about? Yeah, so many of our families, it's I like to compare it to the value prop of WeWork. So many remote workers like to go somewhere a few times a week or perhaps even every day where they can see other people and uh, you know have access to a kitchen, whatever, right? That's Everyone's familiar with how WeWork works. Many of our students, uh, a minority, but still many, uh, like the same thing. So they want to have access to a place with 3D printers and with, uh, uh, you know, just kids to, uh, yeah. to hang around with because perhaps their family doesn't, isn't plugged into a bunch of communities, yeah. which is something we really emphasize at Sora. So we've created a network of locations through the KaiPod infrastructure for them to go and interact with other Sora students or even students from other schools have access to all those materials, 3D printers included, but, but many others. Um, you know, just a place to go, just a little community, in-person community to form. Uh, I'm excited about this future. I think forever Sora's main thing will be online just because of the access and diversity of opinions that, that grants you and opportunities. Um, but of course, the best product experiences over the next, I'll say century even, I'll, I'll expand the time scale, will be a combination of bits and atoms, right? It'll be software meeting the real world. So Sora will be no different. Yeah. Uh, and um, regarding the uh, uh, services that you uh, offer for meeting up and field trips you were mentioning uh, and uh, occasions for students to actually meet face to face, um, kind of to ferry us to into the businessy questions side. Um, is, is that one of the uh, ways that um, your revenue model might uh, increment uh, uh, revenue on uh, one single student by actually offering some additional services uh, that they might or might not buy? Definitely, that is a long-term thing. I think the beautiful thing about Sora, but also every independent school, Sora's business model is not unique. You offer a wonderful experience and parents pay for access. Right, parents pay for access for their family and their student. So, Sora is not a speculative company that where one day we're going to build something awesome and figure out a way to monetize it. No, every student who attends Sora pays us money to attend. Right, so it's a very straightforward business model. I think long term, if you have a fired up community of people whose lives you've changed, the opportunities to monetize that are endless. Right, we can place them in schools. We can give all these 
additional experiences. We can connect students with each other, which is such a valuable um, service. Um, yeah, the long yeah, tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me dig into some of the business side questions. But before we do that, uh, you explained so vividly all of what you're doing at Sora. And I almost forgot to ask you, is there anything you would like to show us, some visuals of what's going on at Sora? Oh, yeah. So our academic model is a little hard to understand because it's new, right? So we've filmed uh, or we've created this explainer video, which usually helps uh, squash some of those main questions. So I'll definitely provide that to the audience. <laughs> Welcome to Sora. Here, we do school differently, 21st century differently. Today's students need a modern version of school built around them and the things they care about. Our innovative approach is based on the latest education science. First, you get to choose from a variety of what we call learning expeditions based on your interests. Really like Minecraft, cooking, care about climate change? We have an expedition for you. At Sora, learning is relatable, project-based, and interdisciplinary. Investigate the physics of sharks to learn about engineering, or understand classic literature through video games. And since learning at Sora is mastery-based, we don't rely on tests. How you demonstrate your learning is up to you. You'll get one-on-one -on -one support from your academic advisor to keep you on pace for your goals. And because Sora is online, you can join us no matter what state or school district you live in. Unlike many online schools, Sora is fully accredited with the very best faculty. Plus, all Sora students are involved in leadership and extracurriculars, from the Sora Arts Club to our champion varsity esports team. And who are we? We're a circle of educators, entrepreneurs, scientists, futurists, and parents who want today's students to be the change makers of tomorrow. That's why we're inventing the future of school. All right, thank you for hearing that, Garrett. Um, okay, let's get back to the business side of questions. Uh, what point of your uh, of your business track are you at? Uh, have you received venture capital funding? Uh, if so, what round are you at? Uh, and what kind of funding have you received? Yeah, so we received our first round of funding in 2019, just a little friends and family round and emphasis on little <laughs> and we made that work to iterate the product and we did the classic scrappy startup thing um in 2020 we raised a great seed round from union square ventures which for people who aren't familiar is probably the best or one of the best at least seed stage and series a stage investment um or investment firms in the last you know decade so it's been really incredible to plug into their resources and then last year uh, about 10 months ago, we raised an awesome $18 million round from General Catalyst, which is also, you know, an amazing firm, um, all to fuel this product development and to make Sora undeniably the best school in the world. And now with this launch, <laughs> we are trying to open our doors to help a lot more students, right? We're trying to tell the world that you don't have to be miserable at school. School is the lowest rated uh, enjoyment activity that I mean elder care I believe was the lowest but it's the second <laughs> lowest <laughs> taking care of the the dying was the lowest but school is second <laughs> it's yeah, even yeah. A, it's even below meaningfully below jobs it doesn't have to be that way and the long-term retention of knowledge for students is so poor those two things are a disaster and it doesn't have to be that way so now we're just trying to open our doors um, did our ducks in a row operationally, which we have such a talented team um, to accommodate, you know, many thousands and hopefully millions of students eventually. Uh, what's this new launch here you've been mentioning? Uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times. So we've kept Sora small over the last few years, uh, last four years, almost four years, because it's a really complicated thing, right? Building a school and building all the curriculum, building all the software and iterating. We've certainly made mistakes. Every school does. There's There's a common saying in the school industry no school knows what they're doing for three years <laughs> which actually is kind of true just because it's so complicated right you need to tweak so many things and now entering year four we feel really good about where we're at so we're ready to open up to our wait list and hopefully a lot more students um, to make this 
uh, a school that can help as many kids who are excited by it, right? So hopefully that'll be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions <laughs> eventually, but we're going to start with uh, a few thousand now. A few thousand. Okay. And do you, what's the time plan behind that? We'll see. We'll see. So we're trying to gear up to not, uh, or I'll say it the other way. We're gearing up to be ready to accept and accommodate students when they want to come instead of us being bottlenecked operationally. I think we're really close to that. So if a okay, uh, hundred thousand students and families listen to this episode and they want to come to Sora, we will be ready for them. <laughs> Great, amazing. Uh, how many students do you have now? And I totally understand this has been a group that you've consolidated the Sora, Sora project with. So we've had the same amount for three years. So the first okay. year we just had uh, 14 and 38, and now we have 150. So keeping yeah. this group, iterating with them, they're all very, their parents and their students are wonderful people, and they're all very involved in giving us feedback and tweaking the program. Uh, we just launched a new campus, so hired new faculty and trained them. So they're ready for uh, more students for a January start date. Virtual campus. Uh, virtual yeah, campus, sorry. right. <laughs> a virtual, we call them campuses because the faculty are a, a pod, but we just launched this new campus. So we have additional capacity now. Um, but yeah, the name of the game is growth over the next 12 months. And I can't, well, hopefully forever. And I cannot be more excited. Uh, can you disclose pricing? Yeah, so it's on our website. It's $12,000 per student per year. Um, but 50% of our student body is on financial aid. So if you don't think you can afford $12,000 a year, which I understand is reality for many people, you can apply for a financial aid program and you got a pretty good shot of getting it. That's been important to our financial model because it's the right thing to do. Honestly, we want a diverse class. We want uh, many different types of people in for all the reasons we started the conversation talking about. And the reality is to do that, you need to uh, lower the bar for many people. Uh, speaking about diversity, um, I realize uh, going international is hard because of accreditation and because of many uh, aspects that are not up to a startup to solve immediately, of course. But uh, have you onboarded uh, non-native English speakers, perhaps some American U.S. citizens uh, who are uh, native in another language? Have you onboarded non-native English speakers or perhaps English native speakers, but outside the U.S.? Not yet. That's a problem for next year, and I'm very excited to solve it. But it's uh, we we talk about intentional growth at Sora. I have no doubt that the market for the best school in the world for a transformative education is limitless. <laughs> you know, it's the biggest. If you want to talk about business, it's the biggest market opportunity that exists, except perhaps <laughs> healthcare. No, I'll say even above healthcare. Um, so we don't want to do things that may harm people, right? And so ESL. English second language, and also just offering Sora in other languages is a really big thing. And we want to give respect to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you spoke about uh, Sora, the best school model there is, as uh, you're, uh, you're um, very self-confidently um, uh, stating. Uh, what's your competition out there? Is there any competition uh, that you feel uh, might be competing, at least in some of the aspects? Or do you feel like you're unique? We're 100% unique. Uh, there, if you split our business in half, so the transformative education on one side and the um, online flexible aspect on the other, there are competitors in both these spheres. So there's, uh, if we're talking online, there's really pricey options, but also high quality traditional options like Stanford Online High School, or there's like Laurel Springs, or there, these are all traditional programs, right? They were built a long time ago and they look like it, right? In fact, I went to one, I won't say which one, uh, I went to one in high school as well when I was moving and it's old. It's mostly asynchronous, it's isolating, it's it's school, but online, right? It's, it's COVID school, <laughs> but a little better that many of the students experienced and it works for some, doesn't work for most. So that's the competitors on that side. And then there are competitors in the transformative progressive education space, but most of these are brick and mortar schools. Yeah. Almost all of them are brick and mortar schools, right? So if yeah. you live close to one and you can drop 30 to $65,000 a year, that's an option for you. That is not an option for most people though, right? So how can we combine the flexibility, the quality, the access, the diversity of this realm 
with the transformative world-class high fidelity education over here and mold them into one. We're the first one to do that. I'm pretty confident in saying there are a couple that have popped up recently, but they're in like the years one and two curve now. And I know how tough years one and two are. <laughs> and we have a significantly, uh, we have significantly more funding and um, I'll say expertise. <laughs> so uh, I think we're far ahead. It's just a, it's a non-trivial problem. And now I think we've solved much of it. And we're excited, as I said, to grow and help a lot more students. And you've gone through those three years you were mentioning uh, uh, the, you know, when you were citing, uh, it takes three years to actually know. Exactly. What it's funny to hear some of our venture capitalists and our investors and, and board members, they are frequently rated as some of the best in the world. And it's funny to hear them say things like, this might be the most complicated business. <laughs> like this, this is up there, right? And so we just, we knew that going in, we wanted to be slow. We wanted to be intentional. We wanted to give that the respect it deserves. Uh, but now I think our team, our awesome team has cracked it. Okay. At least a lot. There's always room for improvement. In fact, I cannot, my mind is going a thousand miles per hour, thousand kilometers per hour, sorry. Uh, uh, all day, every day about ways to make this just a mind blowing, you know, 10 star experience. But right now we're at like six stars, you know, we're like the best school, but there's so much room for even making this, you know, yeah, incredible. Um, so uh, you're um, close to the grand opening, the great onboarding of Sora schools, uh, this great new launch. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the marketing strategy from now on? Sure. Uh, I think a cool parallel is like mental health, right? Many of people after COVID and even before COVID, they don't like their school. Their kid is miserable. Uh, perhaps they've had uh, interactions that make them think this cannot be as good as it gets. Much like how people, uh, let's talk about something as sensitive as like postpartum depression, right? Mothers will be like, uh, I feel like a horrible person for feeling this way, blah, blah, blah. I doubt anyone else feels this way, blah, blah, blah. You just have to remove the stigma that things are bad and there's another option out there. So that's, a, that's an analogy we like using. I think education, it's going to be a, a consumer research thing. Luckily we have, uh, I probably shouldn't say yet, but we have legitimately the best or a top three uh, marketing and brand uh, agency and people working with us. So we want to crack this. We think um, the world will be a better place if we do. It's just an uphill battle because everyone did school. Everyone thinks they know how education should work because they were subjected to 12 plus years of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you already been able to have some external parties run some uh, evaluations, impact evaluations, or uh, um... Uh, some some kind of evaluation on uh, the uh, education that happens at Sora. I've circled the next 12 months for efficacy studies. It's actually really hard because what would you compare it to? Like the things that we can compare it to, is we know our students are happier. We know our students uh, are more connected. We know, we, so we know all these things for education quality. It's hard because we're comparing it to ourselves. There are not many great high fidelity inter or interdisciplinary schools. They're not many, uh, it's just kind of apples and oranges, right? So it'll be a very expensive study to run. We'll need more participants. So after we grow and we have uh, thousands of students who want to participate, I think we'll be able to make something pretty convincing. Uh, but for right now, it's mostly the, the benefits we're selling, right? Your student will be happier. Your student will have a better understanding of the real world and why learning is important. And I think that is all you know, most of what matters. <laughs> yeah, that sounds super exciting. And of course, uh, with uh, Sora schools being still uh, quite relatively new, I mean, uh, 2019 was your launch date. You also don't really have such a, a, a big uh, um, a pot of alumni to be uh, able to, uh, or, or do you have some alumni that you're already using as a uh, as a flag and as a banner to say, hey, uh, this person has gone to Sora and take a look at what they're doing now. We only have a handful of alumni, right? Yep. People who joined us as as juniors, really. Uh, but we already have amazing students. It, 
it's hard to say successful because what that means depends on you know the person but uh, we have students who i think uh, as i mentioned before got uh, job offers immediately to top like game design companies and that yeah. was their goal which does not usually happen for people without college degrees so breaking yeah. down the barriers there we've been accepted to really prestigious mm -hmm. schools like georgia tech and and RISD and, uh, and many others. So we have this acceptances. Parents can rest in the fact that they don't need to choose between a miserable kid with future prospects or a happy kid, right? Yeah. They yeah, can yeah. be both. And, and I'm sure during COVID times, uh, uh, the 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 <laughs> uh, mental uh, health side of uh, students was something that Sora uh, school students were already much more able to preserve and. Uh, uh, avoid some of the negative impacts uh, on the mental health side that uh, unfortunately have impacted the students in traditional education systems through COVID. Yeah, of course, we, as with everyone, millions of people dying in a global pandemic weighed on everyone, uh, but our students noticed much less disruption than, than other schools. In fact, in the early days, it was sometimes easy to forget that all these schools were closing and there was so much drama around because for us, it was just, you know, Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing it this way for a while. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today, Garrett. Uh, I'm really excited about all of what's going on at Sora. I'm excited about this new launch. Uh, hopefully uh, the release date uh, of this interview is going to coincide with uh, uh, your new launch and onboarding times. I'm really curious to see uh, where Sora is going to go, how it's going to evolve, and how you're going to be able to impact the educational uh, system, uh, both in the United States and hopefully outside the United States eventually. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us today, and uh, I'll be monitoring, uh, of course, what's going on, and uh, hopefully uh, be speaking to you again. Thanks for inviting me. This was fun.